Well, I extend a welcome and a greeting to all of you in the name of Jesus. They're calling this day here a celebration of life. And wow, this is like a reunion of life. <laughs> of, if your experience is like mine, and I'm sure it is, you've seen people that you have not seen for a long time, and it's like, wow, I could take a half a day to catch up. But we are here gathered with Warren's family and his friends and relatives to a celebration of life. Life given by God. Life lived in God. It was God in Warren's life that we celebrate. It is God in our lives that we want to reaffirm and to celebrate. I'm going to read three short portions of scripture that reaffirms this celebration. The first is an invitation by Jesus to come. The second one is an encouragement from Jesus. And the third is an assurance from Jesus through the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. John 14, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you, I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me, that you also may be where I am. Paul, in writing his last letter to Timothy and encouraging him and in giving him charges, realizing there in prison that he is nearing the end of his earthly life and he writes this for I am already poured out like a drink offering and the time has come for my departure I have fought the good fight I have finished the race I have kept the faith now there is store for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me on that day not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. And that's us. I was invited by the family, if now would be a time, to share a few uh, comments about Warren's involvement in my life. Warren was an older cousin, and I knew of him in growing up here in the Bowmansville area, and they lived in several burps. But after at beginning to attend the Alsace Church and being there for a length of time, I got to know Warren. I could feel very comfortable around this man who exampled his love of God. Warren lived the life God gave him. His life was my teacher. As a young pastor, Warren was a godly mentor to me. It is the love of God that makes the difference. It is God we celebrate in remembering Warren's life. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to get a songbook. I want to invite you to turn in the Mennonite hymnal to number 735. 735. I believe this, I'm going to read this prayer. I want you to follow it prayerfully. I think it's a very appropriate prayer for the beginning of this service in celebrating life. 
celebrating the life of our brother. Number 735, Lord, you are our God. We want to realize how much we depend upon you. You have not only given us life, but you have made us able to think about its meaning and to choose and to work for what is good. In the world, much is confusing. Many voices strive to be heard, yet we have your word to guide us. The life and teaching of your son, the example of many faithful Christians. We have known your hand holding us fast, your steps marking the way for us. We long to know you still. Your presence transforms even the darker times. With you, we need not be afraid. Nothing can separate us from your love. Draw out from us such an answering love that our, in our test, time of testing, we may not fall away from you. The rest of the program will be followed as written in your bulletin.
I'd invite you to join me in prayer together. <clears throat> Father, we are so grateful for your great faithfulness. Thank you for providing all we need, and most of all, thank you for your son, Jesus. It's because of hope in you that we can gather and, and can celebrate even the passing of someone. But you recognize that with our celebration, there is uh, mixed Within that, our mourning and our sorrow. And in Ecclesiastes, you, you remind us that that's good. Good for us to come into a house of mourning and, and to take these things to, to heart. So I pray, God, that this time of, uh, of connecting with one another, connecting with you, connecting with memories, that it would all bring honor and glory to you. In your son's name we pray, amen. As I mentioned in my prayer, God through Ecclesiastes does tell us that it's good for us to gather together into a house of mourning because we reflect on our own lives and the brevity of that. We think of the person who has passed their life, we consider our own, and we consider what God says about each. I should say that in my uh, connection with Warren and my experiences are somewhat limited. So I know Warren somewhere around uh, 2015 when Alsace Church would have closed, Warren began attending Gaiman Mennonite Church where I pastor. And so I knew um, Warren in his latter years. I knew Warren as someone who was kind and gentle, quiet and thankful and joyful. He didn't say much, but it's easy for me to picture Warren now with a smile on his face and a Bible in his hands. As this uh, service was being prepared, um, you know, I thought about Warren. He's been a pastor, a church leader for many, many years. He preached many sermons. Um, he would have had countless hours of reading and studying God's word. And he prepared some things for his, his uh, funeral service and for the, the, the pastor who would be giving the meditation. He provided one verse. <laughs> I thought about that, and uh, that wasn't, uh, I don't think, by accident. Um, I think Warren wanted it to be short and sweet, short and significant, and uh, it, it kind of, to me, says a little bit of, of who he is. He didn't have to say a lot, but it was, it was important and significant. And the verse he chose is listed there in your program. It's Psalm 17:15. Which says, as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness or in your presence. Lord, what would you have me to say about one sentence? This is what I believe uh, God led me to share about. So the, this verse begins with, as for me. The context of this verse, um, the few verses before it, he's contrasting himself with the people of the world who is described as men of the world whose portion is in this life. Their focus, their source, their... Um, their aim were things of this world. And he is contrasting himself with this statement the psalmist is, as for me. It's saying, I want to live differently. I want to live set apart. I want to be different from someone whose eyes are on the things of this world. God is the source of my happiness, my blessing, my contentment. Nothing is as valuable, and we need nothing more. Psalm 73, 26 says, My flesh and my heart fail, 
but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. My portion, my allotment, my, my share, my source. When I considered the, the phrase, as for me, does that bring to your memory any other scripture, any other incident where someone was saying, as for me? Joshua. Joshua, when it was a time of, of struggle, he was seeing some of the Israelites going after other gods. In a time of decision, he was saying, choose for yourselves today. You know, who you're going to serve. Are you going to serve these other gods? As for me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's kind of this defining statement that, okay, there are people around me who are not choosing this way. I'm making a decision here. I'm saying, as for me. That's how this verse begins. As for me, it expresses this decision, this proclamation that God is my source. As for me, my source is the Lord. There are several words that begin with S that came up. I don't usually try to do that, but it, it seemed to just jump out at me. So source is a key word in this verse, and the source is the Lord. The next one was sight. So as for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I will see your face. Matthew 5, 8 says, Blessed are the poor in heart, for they will see God. 1 Corinthians 13, 12 now we see a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. In Revelation 22, describes how there will be no more curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb are in the city. His servants will serve him and they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Sometimes... Uh, I go running early in the morning, and it's still dark, and I'm running through the town of Adamstown, and occasionally I'll hear a dog inside the house either see me or sense me, I think probably hearing my footsteps maybe, and I'll start barking. And it's at, in those moments that I'm kind of glad I'm not a dog owner. <laughs> I want one a barking dog at my house at 5.30 in the morning. But anyhow, these dogs, I think at least certainly in some of the situations, they don't see me, but, but they know I'm there. I thought about the example, too. Sometimes we, we sit in church and there might be a, or a, an auditorium somewhere. There might be a, a young family in front of us with a, a young child, and they haven't haven't learned the, the social niceties of staring straight ahead and they turn and, and stare backwards or look at you and uh, I sometimes, like some of you, maybe start engaging in some eye contact and, and very quickly this little game of uh, peekaboo, you know, ducking out of ducking out of uh, view and then popping back in and smiling and trying to engage and to help that child feel safe and I'm amazed at what young children can enjoy this little peekaboo thing and it's this idea that they know someone's there even when they can't see them and that's a little bit like our childlike faith that we're supposed to have in this Lord who we don't see physically right now, but we know he's there. And that's the kind of faith I feel like this verse is talking about. As for me, I will see your face. It's a confident statement that there's a day coming when I will be with you and I will see your face. Adam and Eve tried to hide, but they knew God could see them. The Israelites, when they were uh, at the water, and the armies were behind them. They grumbled because they couldn't see how God would deliver them, but he would. Elisha 
when the city was surrounded by an enemy army, prayed that God would open the spiritual eyes of the servant so he could see the armies of the Lord protecting them. We walk by faith, not by sight. As for me, I will see your face. The next section of the verse says, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness or in your presence. And this, I, I will be satisfied, I noticed, was what was underlined in Warren's Bible. I will be satisfied. Matthew 5, 6 says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied or filled Psalm 4, 6, and 7 says, Many are asking, Who can show us any good? Let the light of your face shine upon us. You have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. You've made known to me the path of life. You fill me with joy at your presence, with your presence, in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Being satisfied with the Lord is something that I saw lived out in Warren's life. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than diamonds, and nothing I com desire compares with you. That's a, a chorus that's, I believe, based on Proverbs uh, 3, speaking of wisdom, but I think indirectly speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm wondering if we could sing that chorus together. <clears throat> Lord, you are more precious. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, kind of satisfaction in the Lord that Warren lived out. I believe it was that desire that nothing else that I might desire compares with living for you that would have led him to take a young family, to live in a camper, to get further Bible training. You know, some people probably called that crazy. What are you, what are you doing? You know, I'm sure he got questions about that. But to him, that was more valuable. Nothing I desire compares with you. He is our source. He is to be our sight. This, this that we not fix our eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen, what is eternal. He is our satisfaction. And finally, he's our salvation. Jesus died because we needed a Savior. Somewhere along the line, someone summed up the good news of the gospel to me with four words, and they have stuck with me. And that is plan, problem, solution, and decision. God had a plan. He loves us. We have a problem. We have rejected his love. He provided a solution, and that's Jesus, but we are called to make a decision. It's that kind of decision that this verse speaks of when it says, as for me. As we are blessed to have some connection with, with Warren and his life and his faith, uh, and we're called together here today to reflect on that, may we reflect on our own lives and I pray that each one of us here would know, um, would know the Lord as our source, would be looking to him as our, our sight, would be satisfied with what is truly worthy of valuing. 
and that we would find our salvation in him and him alone. As for me, Jesus is Lord. Let me read the verse one more time. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the blessing of life. Thank you for the blessing of relationships. I recognize that there are many here that have uh, deep connections with one another, and I pray that this time that we have to share uh, would be sweet and our fellowship would honor and glorify you. And as we reflect on this, this earthly life that has that has concluded on this earth, that we would reflect on our own and our commitment to you. I pray that each one who hears these words would know you, the joy and peace and hope of loving and serving you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. My name is Lucinda Swartzen Trooper. I am the youngest daughter of William and Viola Weaver, and my mother Viola is Warren's youngest sister, who is still living at Virginia Mennonite Retirement Community in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Her heart is truly with us today, but she was not able to make the trip. So she's eagerly waiting this service to come back to her. Our family was asked to gather some memories of my Uncle Warren. This came easily for us, and it's an honor to share this compilation of our memories with you as we celebrate his life today. I will pause between the memories. Uh, we're not saying which daughter or son they came from, but they're just a compilation of all of them. Um, the first memory that came to me was how his voice sounded, soft, gentle, and kind. I can hear his laughter still. My most recent memories are when his sons, Linford and Mike, would drive him to Virginia to visit his sister Viola, my mother. My mother enjoyed these visits so much. The boys would even bring lunch, and we would sit together and share memories. When I think of memories of Warren, it brings back memories of the family when we were all young. That big house and the meadow and the beautiful creek, the little playhouse in the front yard. It was like a fairy tale to us who grew up in the city. They had an open home. At least it seemed like we went there overnight every time mom and dad had other responsibilities. Warren was present never spoke that much, but he always led a beautiful prayer at the meals. At the most recent cousin gathering at Susan's home, Warren had a few beautifully made checkerboard games laying on a table. We bought three of them, one for each of my girls and their families. It was a special Christmas gift, and even their grandchildren were delighted. Warren's sister Viola and our mother had high regards for her brother Warren. Warren was the closest brother to her in age, and so they walked to school together, would walk home for lunch, back to school, and then home for chores in the evening. She talks about working with Warren and other siblings preparing celery for the market. She loved her family and has wonderful memories of her childhood years with her brothers and sisters. Before Warren married Verna, many times they did together things with our parents. Verna was a cousin to dad, and of course, mother was a sister to Warren. These are some of my personal ones now. Both my oldest sister and I recalled the impact on us of observing Warren's daily practice of giving Verna a tender kiss when he was either leaving the house or returning from work. We both, my sister Priscilla and I, requested that this practice is in our own marriages. And we give Uncle Warren a lot of that credit. A couple months ago, when I was spending time with my mother, I asked if she would like to call her brother Warren. Mother at age 92, is aware that her mind and her ability to discuss is waning. And she was not so sure it would be a good idea. I assured her, I'm here, I'll be there, and I'll fill in any gaps if you're not sure what you want to say. I remember as he called and Warren answered the phone, and after I told him that mother would like to talk briefly with him, I heard the words from Warren to Viola saying, well, hello, my sister. The endearing conversation that followed left me a bit tearful as I listened on a conversation between two beloved siblings that had a very deep bond between them that defied any waning minds. There was no need for me to fill in any of the gaps. And my most recent memory. I was the one who told my mother that Warren had died. I sat across from her and I said, Mom, I have some news for you. Warren's heart was growing tired 
and he died early this morning. With a bright clarity of mind and voice, she responded, Oh, he's home. I'm not sad, Cinda. I'm going to be home soon, too. And then she proceeded to tell me this. You know, I couldn't sleep last night. And I decided to get up and sit on my chair and turn the light on. I wasn't hurting or anything. I just decided to sit in the quiet for a long time. Now, she's usually a very sound sleeper. Now, I admit, I don't really know how the spirit works. But I told her, you know, possibly you were awakened to sit vigil as Warren's spirit moved on to the next world. Because, Mother, it was over exactly the same time that he passed. She smiled and said in her comical way these days, well, I don't really remember thinking about him at that time, but you know what? Maybe my spirit was with him. <laughs> we both agreed it was the most beautiful thought. She is eagerly waiting to hear about this service, which we will share with her. He was truly a beloved brother to her. One can easily see a theme running through already what was said today about our Uncle Warren's life. He was a gentle, soft-spoken, kind soul that loved quietly and deeply. We were all touched in a positive way with his life. My name is Michael. I am the youngest of the six children, and I will be sharing uh, some of the memories of my siblings uh, with you this morning. And I'd invite you, as I read them, to look for recurring themes that keep surfacing. Uh, my siblings did not talk with each other before writing them, and uh, so these are their direct thoughts. First, I'll go by order of age, my oldest sister, Susan. Daddy loved God's good earth. He was a wonderful gardener, and I believe helped to motivate most of his children and grandchildren to find joy in planting, tending, and harvesting gardens. For many years, he would call me each spring to ask if my garden plot was ready to till for planting. He taught me how to know when the soil was just right to be tilled. Daddy was a busy man with a full-time carpenter job while also pastoring a church and raising a family. But he took time to plan summer camping trips to state parks, to take the slow family walks down the field lane, and to drive several of us into the city of Reading for Voices of Victory chorus practices. He loved to sing and had a beautiful tenor voice. I have many good memories of singing together. Daddy really cared about the people in the Alsace Manor Mennonite Church and served faithfully as a pastor for 40 years. He demonstrated the joy of service to God and loving respect for all people. Daddy was never harsh in his discipline. I remember an evening church meeting which Daddy was leading. I don't know how old I was, but old enough to know better than to spend the whole time whispering and giggling with my friend. On the way home, Daddy talked with me and expressed his disappointment with my behavior. I don't remember any of the words he said, but the fact that he was disappointed with me was harder on me than any punishment he could have meted out. Daddy loved our mama dearly, and that love was demonstrated very clearly in our home. He also cared so tenderly for mama during her years of decline from dementia. Daddy was a quiet man, but full of wisdom and an acceptance of what was. When we were young and anticipating a special trip or a picnic, we would ask, Daddy, what will we do if it rains? And he would calmly answer, well, 
we'll just let it rain. <laughs> what a picture of surrender to the will of God and rest in his love. We had a good, godly, wonderful daddy, and he will be missed. From my sister Naomi, lessons I learned from daddy. Here you see the recurring theme. Learn to be content regardless of my circumstances. When we were fussing about a rainy day, he said, do you know what we're going to do if it rains? You know. <laughs> we're going to let it rain. <laughs> Think positive. Believe the best in people. Work hard, but take the time to play. He passed on an appreciation for God's creation, taking walks, going for a drive on back roads. If we'd asked if he's lost, he'd say, no, I just don't know where I am right now. <laughs> going camping, pointing out trees and flowers and learning their names and learning to identify birds by their song. He could also whistle loudly through his fingers and I practiced and practiced until I was able to do it too. Show love and respect to your spouse and children, and it will flow out to others. We were used to seeing him show affection to mama, and it gave me a great sense of security. Listen to God's call on your life and follow his leading. It seemed he had an acceptance of his calling and was able to fulfill the call to the ministry, along with working a full-time job as a carpenter, raising a family, and enjoying a big garden, which seemed to be his therapy. He loved singing, especially four-part harmony, and taught us to love it too. I enjoyed singing with him and hearing his beautiful tenor voice. He was very creative with wood and made many beautiful things with his hands. I think that his creativity has been passed down to his children and grandchildren in many different ways. I have a very distinct memory of being asked by my mother to go tell daddy that breakfast was ready. When I reached the door to his study, I found him kneeling at his chair praying. It made a big impact on me as a young girl. He led by a godly example he loved the Lord and served him faithfully for 94 years. We love you, Daddy. You will be missed. My sister Joanne, I remember the whole family working in the garden, weeding, hoeing, and afterwards Daddy would take us to the Ole Turnpike Dairy for ice cream cones, and we could pick any flavor we wanted. When it was about time for Daddy to come home from work, some of us children would walk out to the bend in the lane and wait until he came. Then we would climb up on the running boards of his work truck and ride back in the lane. Daddy would come home from work and sit on the couch to read the mail, and I would comb his hair. And I remember walking into Daddy's study and find him kneeling by his chair praying. My brother Linford. Our father was a bivocational pastor and had to squeeze in study time whenever he could. This often happened early mornings and Saturdays. I remember Saturdays when I would take my latest project, knocking on his study door, wanting affirmation of what I had built, or in search of a solution for something I couldn't figure out, both the affirmation and suggested solutions were freely given. He was a lover of the soil, a farmer at heart. Gardening was his idea of recreation. I remember his footprints in the freshly tilled soil as he followed the rototiller back and forth across the garden, one foot pointing straight forward, the other foot turned slightly outward. I remember dropping seeds into a freshly made row while I followed covering and tamping them down with my bare feet. Later, when they moved to Pricetown, he spent many years amending the soil of his various garden plots, slowly fashioning a silk purse out of a sow's ear. 
I spent many hours playing on the creek with a raft he built for me out of a wooden platform over two oil drums. Later, he added paddle wheels with an old chain-driven tricycle, handlebars and seat removed, turned upside down, and wooden paddles fastened to the rear wheels. I clocked many a nautical mile on that short stretch of the Manitowney Creek. Woodworking was one of his other hobbies. As a boy, I loved hanging out in the shop with him, especially in the winter when I could feed the wood scraps into the old pot-bellied stove that heated the shop. All of his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren have multiple items he made for all of us over the years. He enjoyed travel and would have likely done more of it if circumstance had allowed. Once, when I was leaving on a post-high school road trip to Oregon, he said, I wish I was going along. Daddy, I'm sorry you had to make this last journey <clears throat> on your own. I wish I could have gone along. My sister, Mayetta. Here are my memories, starting with a poem. At the rising of the sun and its going down, we remember them. At the blowing of the wind and in the chill of winter, we remember them. At the opening of buds and the rebirth of spring, we remember them. In the blueness of the sky and in the warmth of summer, we remember them. At the rustling of leaves and in the beauty of autumn, we remember them. So long as we live, they too shall live, for they are now a part of us as we remember them. I will remember Daddy through the seasons. Daddy thoroughly enjoyed God's creation. He noticed the swelling buds on the backyard maples in spring. He loved the warmth of summer. He thought the autumn colors around our property were some of the best, and even in his latter years, he could still get excited about a winter snowstorm. He also loved our pond just off the back porch. He often stopped on his way past to observe the fish, frogs, and water lilies. While we lived as neighbors for 10 years, many conversations were about the natural world and the changes from season to season. He passed on to me his love of gardening, so I was happy to continue caring for the gardens that he had carefully tended for many years. In our first seasons of gardening and lawn care, he enjoyed helping with the mowing and rototilling, but when that became difficult, he very much enjoyed helping me shell peas, clean beans, and husk corn. He always kept his eye out for the first ripe strawberry, and he was always interested in what I was planting or harvesting. I will miss telling him about the gardens and asking his advice. He was a kind and grateful dad, always thanking me for each meal and never a complaint. As he aged and certain things became more difficult or unsafe, he graciously accepted the changes that needed to be made without resistance and always gave thanks for his children's care for him. He was a true example of faithfulness in prayer, Bible reading, following Christ in daily life, and loving our mother as a husband and caregiver. He loved his family well and passed on a wonderful legacy. I am so thankful to God that he gave me daddy. I could easily echo all of the memories of my siblings, but I'll take mine in a slightly different direction. Any of you who knew daddy knew him as a reader. And of all his children, I will claim to have most followed in these particular footsteps, even in questionable ways. <laughs> I'll read to you from the transcript of family interviews I conducted 30 years ago when I was still a single college student. First, my mother, Verna, speaks about daddy. Quote, 
Another thing that bugged me was when he sat at the table while we were eating and read a magazine. <laughs> My sister Naomi turns to me and says, you listen to that, Sonny. I'm afraid there are girls today that would feel the same way. <laughs> and Daddy replies, she never quite broke me of that. <laughs> I am sometimes too much my father's son. I'm sure money was tight raising six children, but we were never magazine poor. We had a magazine rack with six shelves, which, if you are a reader, is kind of like owning a Cadillac. <laughs> Always a weekly news magazine, a farming magazine, National Geographic, all the Mennonite periodicals. In retirement years, he frequented the library and the bookmobile. He was an omnivorous reader. I always enjoyed asking him, what are you reading? In his final years, each move trimmed his personal library further. Still, he kept his favorites. The great nature writer Edwin Way Teal, books on Mennonite history and thought. If he had a sweet spot, I think it would be books about someone taking a particular piece of poor and worn out land and restoring it to health and beauty. To be a reader is to approach life with curiosity, seeking knowledge and understanding, and hopefully gaining some measure of empathy for people and characters beyond your experience. And that is what I saw and hope to emulate in my father. Finally, each of us as children spent countless hours sitting in church services under our father, literally hundreds of sermons. Do I remember them? Not so much. <laughs> but I do remember his life. And one image that does stick in my mind from those services, at the end of the service, daddy would extend his hand towards the congregation and say these words which I offer to you and to him from the book of Numbers. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Good morning. My name is Alicia Gierschick, and my parents are Tim and Susan Gierschick. Um, my mother, Susan, is Warren's oldest daughter. And um, I asked my brothers to give me some memories of Grandpa, and I'm going to add mine to them as well. So I'm going to go in reverse age order and give um, my younger brother Matthew's thoughts first. Matthew said that he'll always remember Grandpa for his time. Grandpa always made you feel that he mattered, uh, that you mattered, and spent time with you whether it was making things at his wood shop, um, feeding his chickens, or attending to the gardens. Matthew remembers spending a couple of days uh, sitting in the shade by the brook with his BB gun, scaring crows away from the garden for Grandpa. And then when Grandpa got home from work, they spent some time talking and sitting with Grandma while she made supper for them. Most of my own memories of spending time with, at my grandparents' house are from family gatherings, <clears throat> when my siblings and cousins and I would run off and play in, in the meadow or in the yard or downstairs with all the toys in the, the basement. So I don't have a, a ton of memories of individual time spent with my grandfather, but I do remember him as sort of this steady, quiet, and loving presence in my life. And I would often remember um, finding him sitting in his easy chair by the window, reading a book or a magazine, and he's from one of the many stacks of available books and magazines near at hand. And like my brother, I, I count Grandpa as one of the reasons I grew up loving reading and books. And even when I was an adult, I remember I would, when we talked, we would, he would ask me what I was reading, and I would recommend a book sometimes, and then find out later that he went to the library and, and asked for that book, which is always a nice feeling. And lastly, I wanted to read my older brother Tim's thoughts. 
Um, it said, raise up a child in a way they should go, and in the end they won't depart. Most define this spiritually, rightly so, but in the case of my grandpa, I also think of this as life choices, focus, and interests. He and I had similar personalities. We didn't speak a lot, but we did spend time together, and much of what I learned of woodworking, vegetable gardening, love of nature and geography, lifetime love of reading, and general care and craft of life I picked up from him. He taught me to, to identify some of my first bird songs by ear. Grandpa was always a strong and kind presence in my world, no matter if we were near each other, and I will carry and share that my entire life. And I think there most definitely is ice cream in heaven. Good morning, my name is Sonia Charles. I am um, the second daughter of Naomi Miller, who is the second daughter of Warren and Verna Martin. I will be sharing memories of Grandpa from my older sister, Laura Peachy, and my younger brother, Chad Miller, and myself. First memories from my sister, Laura. I have good memories of Grandpa coming home after a long day of work on the construction crew the smell of wood mixed with the great outdoors, seeing him come through the kitchen door and embracing grandma in the kitchen with a kiss to say, honey, I'm home. This embrace spoke to me as a child. It gave me a sense of security and modeled, that I was, um, and modeled what I desired in marriage as I became of age. Grandpa lived out his faith. Fond memories include walking, waking up in the morning and peeking in and seeing him pour over God's word at his desk in their, in their bedroom, sitting in the pew and listening to him, being used by God to impart truth and wisdom, seeing his acts of kindness and compassion as grandma, grandpa, and I would stop and pick up an elderly lady on our way to church. He modeled his life after Jesus. He loved well, listened well, and imparted wisdom without judgment. I am honored to say, Job well done, Grandpa. From my brother, Chad. I remember summer days building boats with Grandpa in his wood shop and spending endless hours floating them with cousins in the creek. Another memory I have is after I returned to Grandpa's house when Haley and I were dating and seeing the love that he and Grandma had for each other. We treasured the time we spent with them as we walked through their amazing gardens it was fun to see their excitement as they told us about each and every plant. Memories from me. Growing up in Indiana meant two trips to Pennsylvania to visit Grandma and Grandpa Martin each year. A week at Christmas and a week around the 4th of July because that's when ex the extended Martin family reunion was held. There are only fond memories from those weeks spent at Grandpa's. I always felt welcomed and accepted by Grandpa. He embraced life and family with love, care, and curiosity. I never remember hearing a negative or judgmental word from my grandfather. Attending church with them, I experienced the mutual love and respect he shared with his congregation at Elsus Manor. I witnessed firsthand his love for gardening and the bounty of the fruit it produced. After moving to Pennsylvania in my early 20s, I would sometimes visit them for the weekend. One weekend, I got to help Grandpa harvest so many cabbage, we filled up his small pickup truck bed, and we hadn't even harvested the whole patch. More recently, my family has enjoyed, had enjoyed going to visit Grandpa um, and visiting, also visiting the Conestoga House and Gardens and having him to our house and farm. I am so grateful that my sons also were able to make small wooden boats with their great-grandpa and float them in the same creek that I did as a child. As a teen, I remember asking Grandpa what one verse was that he found meaningful in his life. After a pause to consider, he said, Micah 6, 8, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. 
Grandpa's life matched his words, and his words matched this verse. My name is Justin Miller. I am the youngest son of Emmanuel and Joanne Miller, Warren's, my mother, Warren's third daughter, and I'll share a few memories uh, for my two older brothers and myself. Uh, my oldest brother, Jason, the first memory that he gave me, he asked if I could do a version of it. I said, I'm sorry, I haven't mastered that skill yet. All the family probably knows where this is going, but he had a way after mealtime of a slow controlled belch that he said pardon through the belch and the word me after that. And it was, I never looked at it as bad, bad uh, manners. It was just, that was what my grandpa did. And Jason said that was, that was one of his favorite memories. Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know of any of the family that's been able to quite master like he had it. But uh, another memory from Jason is grandpa's hugs. Um, they were substantial. It felt like getting hugged by a tree. I loved Grandpa's curiosity. The last time I saw him, he had just gotten back from the bookmobile with a new graphic novel to try out. And one final memory from Jason. Though he was a preacher, I never felt preached at. Grandpa never seemed to judge or shame me, talk down to me, or try to control or force me to do anything. I think each of Grandpa's children and grandchildren felt genuinely seen, heard, and loved by him, which is a gift that cannot be overstated. And then from my brother, Jonathan, he had said he's been thinking, and the main thing that keeps coming to mind are how grandpa and grandma were always open and loving no matter how my appearance was or what stage I was going through. Another fond memory was building boats and woodworking in grandpa's wood shop. I'm not sure if this is why, but I attribute my love of woodworking to this. Floating our creations on the stream was always something I remember. I always looked forward to grandma's meals and baking, especially sticky buns. I remember sliding down the carpeted stairs over and over again. And I remember the many road trips to see grandpa and grandma being an exciting time and always looked forward to seeing them. And for myself, though I lived over 600 miles away for the first 15 and a half years of my life, I have many memories from my younger years. Some of the first memories that I could think of were at the very tail end of those road trips going to see gran Grandpa and Grandma. Getting into a little argument with my brother Jonathan about who, could, who saw, who got the first glimpse of Grandpa's house as we came up Route 12. But it, uh, it was never very long lived as we were less than half a mile away and it was quickly forgotten once we got there. Um, another special connection I felt I had with Grandpa when my birthday was the day after his and so I got to spend numerous summers um, that we would happen to be out there over the time of his birthday and my birthday. So that was always a, always a highlight for me. Um, in thinking over my memories, there's one common denominator that kind of runs through mine and I've heard it through different of the memories shared already. And I've heard it said that children spell love, T-I-M-E. And that's something that I always felt. That's one thing that, that, that he always had for me, he always made it clear. Whether it was walking to the park um, which boarded their property, uh, wagon rides behind his garden tractor, or as I got old enough, helping me to learn to drive his garden tractor, helping him work in the garden, um, riding along to Wegman's Catering when he went to deliver cabbage and parsley, usually on a Saturday morning, and helping me make the many boats and wooden creations um, in his wood shop. And uh, also one that I had to think of and, and chuckle about was the many games of Uncle Wiggly and Chinese checkers. I know Uncle Wiggly was one, at times he used to get tired of how many times I asked him to play it with me. But uh, once in a while he would request something else, but most times we played at least one round of that one. One thing I remember the most um, about working with Grandpa in the wood shop is that he didn't just make things for me. When I was young, yes, it was more so that way. But as I got older, he took the time to stop and listen and try to envision my idea. And then he did his best to make it just the way I wanted. And that meant a lot to me as a young boy. One area I aspire to be more like my grandpa is in the level of patience he had for his wife and children 
and grandchildren and everyone around him. My name is Mariah Martin. Uh, I'm the daughter of uh, Chloe Grass and Linford Martin. Linford being um, Warren and Verna's fourth child and first son. And I'm speaking for myself and my sister, Hannah Martin. Our early memories are just snippets. Learning the game of Chinese checkers, but never being able to beat him. Drawing an outline of a boat sitting in the shop and watching him build it, and then dragging it up and down the stream. Being squeezed onto the bench in the dining room next to Grandma and giggling after he burped pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Riding in the wagon behind the lawnmower as we bumped across the yard. Our later memories add more to the picture. Flying above his childhood home with him as he took his first plane ride watching him beat us all at croquet one-handed when it was too difficult to bend over and use two hands to beat us all. <laughs> Hearing his most pointed opinions on how to grow celery and seeing him subtly direct the hymn singers on the radio. <laughs> Often quiet, but always attentive, always ready for a sweet treat, always open to read something new, always warm and solid in a hug. My name is Joshua Ludwig. I am a son to Jeff and Mietta Ludwig and grandson to Martin Warren. I'm speaking on behalf of myself, Crystal, Sarah, and Angela. Uh, Crystal's memory is, I recently gave blood for the first time and had been too nervous for many years, but I finally decided I could handle it and also something compelled me to do it. It was only afterwards that my sister reminded me that Grandpa had been recognized for donating gallons of blood. I am so proud of his generosity, even in things that wouldn't be known or noticed by many people, and I now have the privilege to carry that legacy on. My sister Sarah, my best memories of Grandpa are his laugh and his smile. He laughed and smiled easily, especially when he looked on while the cousins did something silly or someone told a good joke or a story. It was easy to laugh when Grandpa was laughing. Angela's memory is, Grandpa was a calm and steady presence throughout my life. I particularly enjoyed spending time with him in his workshop, playing in the sawdust, making designs and pictures with the different textures produced by his woodworking equipment. As an adult, I enjoyed talking with Grandpa about nature and gardening. When I plant my garden at my house this year, I will be thinking of him. Grandpa was never a big talker, but he never left you wondering if he was happy to be with you. If he was happy, to, he was always happy to see you, even if your conversation was short. As for myself, um, it was mentioned before that he used to make boats for all the grandchildren, including myself. But I do recall one instance or two instances where I requested a wooden sword, and obviously that was against his Mennonite upbringing because he knew the direct consequences of those actions would be my sisters, unfortunately. <laughs> And um, many of you may, may have seen it, but I was fortunate enough about five years ago for his uh, 90th birthday to create a video for him where I got all these questions from the family to ask him about his upbringing. And as, as I was doing it, we didn't really speak much after the video was done, but I always wondered what he would think knowing that his life and story would be on the internet forever. But I also know that it would just be followed with a laugh and a smile.
After our closing prayer, we invite you to go to the basement. There is a light uh, noon meal, refreshments, and anyone is welcome to share in that. And you would go down the back stairway and it would be through the doorway on this side of the basement that you file through to uh, help yourself. And in my closing prayer, I also give thanks for the meal that has been prepared for us. I would like to read as a closing prayer out of Psalm 116 a number of verses. Be at rest once more, O my soul, for the Lord has been good to you. For you, O Lord, have delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling, that I may walk before the Lord in the land of the living. How can I repay the Lord for all his goodness to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation, and I will call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. O Lord, truly I am your servant. I am your servant, the son of your maidservant. You have freed me from my chains. I will sacrifice a thank offering to you and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill my vows to the Lord in the presence of all his people in the courts of the house of the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us in this time of celebration, in this time of memory, in this time of sharing and encouragement from your word, from our testimonies of a dear father, husband, brother, relative, and friend that loved the Lord and we have been encouraged and reaffirmed from you through our brother Warren in his life as we celebrated it here together. Thank you for blessing us in so many ways. We were reminded again of the blessing of good food and the meals that Verna would prepare for her family. Lord, we thank you for the meal that has been prepared for us today out of the good hands and hearts of the folks at Game and Congregation. And as we um, partake and eat, bless the conversation as we meet again as friends and family and this time together. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of the family of God and all the good things that you have given to us. In Jesus' name I give thanks. Amen. You are dismissed.